Our lesson now begins along about the middle of the book in chapter 18, where Job is still being accosted by his so-called comforters, in this case, Bildad the Shuhite. Now, as we've said before in our comments on previous studies, disaster is never an organized affair, and the attempt by the scholars and commentators and exegetes and expositors to make the three comforters of Job into some type of, uh, or some branches of philosophy, or some type of comment, is ridiculous. Before the book is over, you find all three men accusing Job of sin, and as a matter of fact, even the man who has the right answer is Elihu, who eventually condemns Job and accuses him of sin, although Elihu is reasoning a little sharper than their reasoning of the other three comforters. A disaster is not an organized affair, and you can't uh, make types and organize the material. I realize the man tends toward sermonizing and outlining. He will tend to try to bracket Job's three comforters and make them into three specific types of accusers. However, a much uh, better type of accusation would be a religion, science, and philosophy when you get the three men. And when it comes to science and religion and philosophy, these three are have great ecumenical agreement when it comes to lining up against the Word of God. And these three men are lined up against Job, and the conversations are getting very heated now. And Bildad says in chapter 18, verse 3, Wherefore are we counted as beasts and reputed vile in your sight? So things are getting pretty hot. Uh, Job has just accused them of being miserable comforters, and now they're taking off into him. And notice in the past as we've, dis we've discussed here, how many times the picture of the Antichrist shows up, and how many times the picture of Christ as a sin offering shows up. For example, in chapter 16, notice in verse 9 and 10, we have a perfect picture of the persecution of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the same thing in Job chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, and it is very clear in Job chapter 16, verse 18, where Job cries, O earth, cover not thou my blood, let my cry have no place. Also now behold my witnesses in heaven, and my record is on high. This is plainly the case of the Lord Jesus Christ and the crucifixion that bespoke of better things than the blood of Abel, where the nation of Israel said, His blood be upon us and upon our children, and the Lord Jesus Christ's blood was not covered, and he being dead, yet speaketh, as the writer of Hebrews says. And now when Bildad the Shuhite takes off into Job and begins to accuse him, everything he says in the next uh, 21 verses deal doctrinally with the Antichrist. Uh, Bildad, to all practical purposes, accusing Job of being the devil. And you notice these passages, especially as they apply to Judas Iscariot, in uh, Job chapter 18, verse 19, and on throughout. Everywhere we find a picture of the Antichrist in Job chapter 18, verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Job answers in chapter 19, How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? These ten times have you reproached me. You're not ashamed that you've made yourself strange unto me. They're estranged. They were good friends. And then he goes on and states his case again, complaining in the bitterness of his soul. And after all, who could throw the first stone at Job when he cries, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. He hath fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and he hath set darkness in my paths. Notice how these ver verses match the condition of an unsaved sinner in hell. He has stripped me of my glory, and taken the crown from my head. He hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone, and mine hope hath he removed like a tree. Or as Dante says in, in his Inferno, abandon ye all hope who enter here. Talking about going to hell. Then Job's complaint reaches a crescendo, in an agony of torment he cries out, my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. My bones leaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Tread lightly on a broken heart. And tread lightly on a man who is going through the fire like Job has. Have pity me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. And when God hath dealt with a man, leave him alone. I mean, comfort him if you can, weep with him if you can, but don't put the vinegar in the wound. 
Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do you persecute me as God, and are not satisfied with my flesh? The Lord has already done the damage to Job. No need to do further damage. Paul says, Rejoice for those that weep, uh, rejoice and weep for those that weep. And Paul says, If one man suffer, then all suffer with it. And he said, Remember those that are in adversity as being in the body with them. When you find somebody in a wheelchair and find some young man dying, and dying before his time in the prime of life, around 25 or 30, weep with him and have pity upon him, but don't add insult to energy. If the Lord has done it, the Lord has done it. Don't you play God. We find great illustrations of this tremendous truth in the concentration camps. There is no literature in the history of literature, I suppose outside of Fox's Book of Martyrs, that could describe uh, the verses we've just read, like the concentration camp literature on the activities of Buchenwald and Bells and Belden, Bells and Auschwitz, and Mauthausen and other concentration camps from World War II. You would think after a poor prisoner had gotten there, and his wife had been suffocated on the boxcars coming, and he'd seen his boy commit suicide in the camp because of pain, and he'd lost his family and lost his friends and lost his job and lost his money and wound up sleeping in the barracks freezing at night with not enough clothes to keep him alive for six months. you think that'd be cause enough to leave the man alone, wouldn't you? But no, the SS men and the sadists among the bunch would take these prisoners and hang them up by their uh, wrists and shoot their wrists off, hang them up by their ankles and shoot their ankles off, They'd bet each other whether they could kill a man with one blow or not, going by the prisoner's line at roll call. They'd hitch him up to horses and make him, uh, hitch him up to wagons and make him sing and haul the load like a bunch of horses. They'd put 75 pound blocks of granite on their shoulders and make them carry him up an incline on their bare feet. The next load would be 85 pound load, the next load a 95 pound load. And they'd carry him up the incline until they fell flat in their face and they were beaten to death with shovels and picks. Why do they persecute them as God? Aren't they satisfied with their flesh? That's what happened to the nation that rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah, and crucified him. And their entire history has been a history of people going after them with no motive in mind at all that could approach the uh, limits of rationality. It was completely irrational. After all, if God had done that much damage, why add to the damage? Why do you persecute me as God and not satisfied with my flesh? And then Job cries out in his distraction and frustration and his misery, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, Job had his prayer answered and never even knew it. He never even lived to see the invention of the printing press. But Job's words were finally printed in a book. As a matter of fact, in our study today, I am reading the printed words of Job from a book. Job cries out that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. And so God honors his request and grants it without his knowledge. For as surely as I am living and breathing and reading this Bible to you here this morning, heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word shall not. And the psalmist said, Thy word, O Lord, forever is settled in heaven. And Job's words have been inscribed eternally upon the rock of ages. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, there he is, and they shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Here is one of the great prophetic pastures on the literal physical resurrection. Job lived about uh, 1800 B.C., or about 1,400 years before Socrates, Plato, Anaximander, Anaximanes, Epicurus, Zeno, and the other fakers who set up the American educational system. And these fakers, no matter what they believed, there was one thing they certainly did not believe in. They certainly did not believe in a physical resurrection where a man had to stand in his body and give account to God for the things or deeds done in the body. Ah, that's the catch, isn't it? And you hedonists and people listening to me that follow situation ethics and Hugh Hefner and the playboy morality and the law of the jungle and the alley cat dog eat dog seekest material of values clarification, you bunch of animals couldn't very well tolerate a physical resurrection, could you? With the moral standards you've got, the moral standards of an alley cat. 
At old Job 1,400 years before the syrup was taken out of Aristotle's formula, said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, which he will. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, which they did, yet in my flesh shall I see God. John says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the, wo in the books, every man according to his works. So Job plainly has enough faith to believe in a physical resurrection, and he believes in the truth and prophesies. Then Zophar comes in to cut the deck again, take another shot at Job, and, Zo and Zophar says in verse 4, Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is, but, uh, is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment? Though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach to the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. And coming on down to the passage, once again we see a detailed description of the Antichrist. There is more material in the book of Job on the Antichrist than there is in the entire New Testament. In chapter 20, the verses that describe the Antichrist are verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. And there isn't a single faculty member on the faculty of any Christian seminary in the country who ever even found the passage. Furthermore, there isn't one commentary written by any Christian expositor from 1611 to the present that even hinted such material was found in the passage. In their zeal to overthrow the authorized text, the scholars went to the Hebrew and the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Coptic and the Aramaic and the Syriac and the Midrashim and the, uh, the Midrash and the Talmud and the Gemara and God knows what and missed the revelation. In Job chapter 21, Job answers again. And then Job says something that his persecutors have entirely overlooked. He says that very often wicked people prosper in this world. The teaching that uh, they're always persecuted and always lose their shirt like they are described in Job chapter 21 is not so. For example, Job contributes this nugget in chapter 21. He said about the wicked, their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth a little one like a flock, and their children dance. They spend their days in wealth, verse 13. Therefore they say in verse 14, To God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Now, Job has brought home a tremendous truth here. The wicked don't always fare bad in this life. Sometimes they fare finely. They fare presumptuously. Didn't you read that passage in Luke 16 that said there was a certain rich man that fared sumptuously every day? Job's persecutors have fallen into the snare the average man falls into into assuming that gain is godliness. And these persecutors have adopted the standard belief that is quite common to human nature, that if a man is in good health and has plenty of money, obviously he's godly and God has blessed him. And this is an error. The disciples say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They figure if the man was born blind, he just had to have done something wrong. One time Jesus Christ said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished. Why were they astonished? Because they figured if you were rich, you just had to be right. That is, they were almost dumb as 90% of the people in America. The greatest Christian that ever lived died in poverty that would make the ghetto of New York look like the Taj Mahal. The greatest Christian in the Bible died without stocks or bonds, without property or holdings, without family, and died in an unmarked grave with no pension, no social security, no food stamps, nothing. So Job brings home a great point. The wicked don't always fare bad in this life. Sometimes they fare much better than the saved people. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. David said he was envious when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. And Job brings this home. And Job says many a time they fare very well in this life. 
There's many an atheist and agnostic that lived to be 90 or 95 and died in fairly good health, around 100. So Job puts forth the question. This is one of the great questions we discussed in our introduction, one of the great essential salient questions of philosophy which no philosopher ever solved. And Job says in Job chapter 21, verse 7, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Now there's a question. There's nothing in the writings of Sartre or Kierkegaard or Barth or Brunner or Tillich that can even attempt to approach the problem. Once a man has decided that everything is relative and there are no absolutes, a word like wicked cannot register in his mind. In the sick mind of these people who have no absolutes, the word wicked, evil, righteous, just, unjust, good and bad, have no meaning. This is why in the public school system your children are not taught good and evil, they're taught values. That's the joker. Now Paul says, wherefore to the, or Job says, wherefore to the wicked live, become old, yea, mighty in power. Now there's a question. How do you explain the uh, meteoric rise of a man like Adolf Hitler? And then going on and on, and when he, his life is a, an attempt is made upon his life, and Stauffenberg and the rest of them try to assassinate him, he's protected and outlives them until Germany is in ruins. How do you explain that? How do you explain a man like Mussolini or Lenin or Stalin going on and on and on with the blood of millions on his hands, bombing out Ethiopia and using modern airplanes against natives who had only horses and killing them by the thousands when their leader was a born-again, saved, Bible-believing Christian? Haile Selassie. How do you explain that? Now, the modern philosophies of Russell, Bertrand Russell, and John Dewey, and the modern system of education set up by Giovanni Gentile and the Fabian Society, there are no answers. As a matter of fact, they can't even understand the question. The question is, wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? George Bernard Shaw had no use for the Bible. He lived to be over a hundred years old in good health. And in his will, he said, there's a Bible, somebody can have it. When I die, it is really a most undesirable possession. But he made a name for himself, made plenty of money. Explain it. Well, there's no explanation for it in Buddhism, except you pretend there's no such thing as righteousness and unrighteousness and wickedness and... Uh, justness and holiness. You simply eradicate yourself and get rid of all the objects by pretending they don't exist, and then put yourself in a self-hypnotic state and pretend you've obtained samadhi or nirvana or prajna, and then die and go home to hell. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, gay, and mighty in power? Well, number one, that some of them may become monuments of mercy. God has let many a dirty, godforsaken rascal go on and on like John Newton, until he was killing people in the slave trade, and so depraved he sold himself out as a slave. God has let many a man go on like that so God could save him and make a monument of mercy out of him and make him sit down and write Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I know a godless, depraved, blasphemous, cussing rascal up in Fairbanks, Alaska that used to go into the juke joints at night and Wednesday night and hold mock testimony meetings. He'd stand up on a table drunk and pretend to lead in prayer and then have people get up and testify about their bottles and their women. You'd think God'd kill a rascal like that, wouldn't you? The Lord didn't. The Lord saved him and called him to preach, and that fellow's up in Fairbanks, Alaska, dumping out tracks and all the juke joints. Why do the wicked become old, live, and become mighty in power? That some of them may become monuments of mercy. Secondly, to build for the righteous. Did you ever stop to think that all the benefits of the modern scientific aid, so-called, and all the benefits of transportation and communication were brought upon us and brought to us by unsaved people for us to use? Thirdly, the wicked become old and mighty in power to demonstrate God's long-suffering. There is nothing that demonstrates the long-suffering of God more than the continual protracted reign of somebody like Bloody Mary or Lucretia Borgia or Napoleon or somebody like the oh, famous French kings and people like Tully and Wallenstein and people like Torquemada 
whose hands were stained with the blood sometimes of thousands and hundreds of thousands of saved people. These men illustrate one of the greatest attributes in the Godhead, God's long-suffering. And when God appeared to Moses in the Mount of, of uh, the Law, Mount Horeb, back in the Old Testament, one of the first things he said to Moses was, The Lord, the Lord God, long-suffering, full of goodness, mercy, and truth. I grant you that if some of us could take over the throne of the universe for a few minutes and see what God sees, we'd blow the whole thing to hell before you could turn around. You say, is that any way for a Christian to talk? That's any man with any common sense at all would talk who was an honest man. If you could see what God sees tonight, the suffering, the disease, the poverty, the starvation, the broken limbs, the broken bodies, the broken homes, the broken hearts, if you could see what God sees tonight, the oppression of Christians in concentration camps in Russia, the blood running like uh, water down the street in Romania and Bulgaria and China for 20 years, as the governments wipe out every last remnant and vestige of Bible-believing people while they're playing ping-pong and coming to the Olympics to try to get you to think they're decent people, if you could see what God could see tonight, you'd pull the switch or press the button. But not the Lord. The Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Wherefore do the wicked live, become older, mighty in power, Job asks? Well, to make their overthrow more spectacular. God will let a man go on, his star will ascend and rise until it shines brighter and brighter with a more luminous glow, till it is baleful as the light of the furnace of the pit. And somebody will say, why doesn't God stop him? Why doesn't God stop him? And boy, when God finally stops him, he stopped witness Adolf Hitler, whose career went on and on and on until the world was shrieking and praying for his death, and then one day he's out there soaked in gasoline and burned to a crisp, barbecued like a fried pig. There's Mussolini with the jaw stuck out in the fascist salute, exactly as the fascists run the Spain and Italy today, and most of Mexico and South America, with the jaw stuck out, bragging about what he's going to do. There he is down there in the piazza, hanging up by his feet with his mistress, beaten to a bloody pulp. God will let them become old and live a long time to make their overthrow more spectacular. There's Napoleon going across Europe, knee-deep in blood, and the sons of, of women and Europe uh, dying behind him like cattle, and the mothers of Europe raising their hands to God in heaven, praying for deliverance from such a monster whose armies ate up uh, Prussia and Germany and Belgium and Holland and France and the manhood and the flower of England. You know where he is one day? One day he's running, fleeing from the battlefield at night, hiding in a peasant's house and looking out the windows at the farmland while the British troops are hunting for him and saying, I wish I could have lived like this. This is the life. And then dying alone out there on the island, looking out across the waves, ostracized, an alien from his own country, an outcast, solitary confinement on a bleak island out there in the Mediterranean. God will let the wicked become old and live to make their overthrow more spectacular. And finally, I mean the Bible has the answers. They're found nowhere in the public school system. They don't know what the questions are. Wherefore do the wicked live, become older, mighty in power, to show clearly that there is a day of adjustment. Now, for a man who doesn't believe in heaven or hell or an afterlife, there is no explanation for Job's question. You cannot explain, though you stay up all night, you cannot explain the misbalances and the inequalities in this world unless you believe in an afterlife. I know what they say. The educators say the trouble is lack of education. Well, you fool, you make your money with education. Why wouldn't you suggest that? I know what they say. The trouble is lack of education. Listen, the German people are 98% literate. Did you see what they did at Bells and Bells and Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Treblinka? The Japanese people are 94% literate. You know what they did at the Bataan Death March? Education has never been the answer. If that education was not a wisdom that came from God and a knowledge from God's Word and an understanding of God dealing with men, it amounted to worse than nothing. When you educated a common thief, he can become a forger or an embezzler instead of a thief. You can't explain dead babies in garbage cans. They show up every morning. Dead bodies in alleys. They show up every morning. Four or five little boys murdered by a man in his forties. Happens every week. 
20 or 25 boys murdered and abused and stuffed into plastic bags in Houston. You can't explain it apart from a future day of adjustment. And if you don't believe there's a God in heaven who's going to make things right eventually and adjust and pay back those to whom payment is due, you're about half insane, you know that? And I say that especially to you people with graduate degrees. You can't figure nothing out. There's no way to explain the misery and suffering and poverty in this world apart from a future day of reckoning. And the Bible clearly gives a day of reckoning. And as Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom mine eyes shall behold, and mine are not another. There'll be a day of reckoning. And Job goes on and talks about the rich. What he says in verse 14 is very instructive. He says about the rich people, Therefore they say to God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Now, strangely enough, when Eliphaz, the Temanite, answers Job in chapter 22, he almost quotes Job when he says in verse 17, which said to God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? Now, this is a remarkable comparison of Scripture with Scripture, which shows that the reference, primary reference that Job is making and that Eliphaz is making are to people just before the deluge, before the flood. Notice in Job 22, verse 15, when Eliphaz says, Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? He says, Which were cut down out of time, whose foundation were overflown with a flood. They're the one that said to God, Depart from us, 22, 17. And when Job says, therefore they say to God, depart from us, in Job 21, 14, the reference is clearly to the antediluvian civilization that lived in the days of Noah and Enoch. And the reason why this is so terrifically instructive is because Job said, in the context of his remarks, they take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. Now, if you remember your reading from the days of Noah back in Genesis 5, 6, 7, and 8, the Lord Jesus Christ said, As it was in the days of Noah, so also shall be in the day of the Son of Man. Well, in the days of Noah, they were saying, Depart from us, we desire not the knowledge of thy ways, and depart from us, what can the Almighty do for us? And these people whose foundation was overflown with the flood took the timbrel and harp and rejoiced at the sound of the organ. Now, you remember in Genesis chapter 4, Jubal was the inventor of the harp and the organ. And these instruments, instead of being used to glorify God with, which was their original function, see Ezekiel chapter 28, the Psalms of David, had become instruments for dancing. Job 21, verse 11, They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. So one of the great marks of the second advent of Jesus Christ, which may have gone unnoticed by the prophetic expositors, prophetic preachers, is the use of the organ as a dance instrument. This is one of the marks, an electronic organ, of the coming flood and the second advent of Jesus Christ. And here we conclude our lesson for this present time. We'll take up lesson number eight on our next recording. Now, once again, in lesson number eight, we take up our study of the book of Job, being well along now in chapter 21. And as we pointed out, the comparison of Job chapter 21, verse 14, with Job chapter 22, verse 17, clearly shows that the days of Noah were characterized by the use of the electronic organ as a dance instrument instead of an instrument to praise God with. We know from studying our Bibles that the organ and the harp and the timbrel were instruments for praising God, as we read in Psalm 150. And the Psalm 150 were told to praise God in the timbrel and with the harp and with the organ, and the dance is even mentioned such as when David danced before the ark of the Lord in first or in second Samuel. And when the prodigal son came home, there was music and dancing about the house. This clearly delineates the distinction between a Bible dance and a, an African dance. The African dance has sex for the main part of the element, and the Bible dances, the women are dancing by themselves in Exodus 15 when they celebrate the crossing of the Red Sea. The men are dancing in Second uh, Samuel where David is 
uh, cavorting before the Ark of the Covenant, and the dancing that takes place at the house of the prodigal son would be like a polka or a square dance where people are rejoicing over the salvation of a soul. Now, this is a far cry from the bunny hug and the grizzly bear and the mamba and the sambo or the samba and the mambo and the big apple and the foxtrot and the frug and the dog and the lame duck the animal dances of Africa that came up through New Orleans, through Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. The Andalusian civilization was, was uh, using the instruments ordained for the praise of God as dancing instruments. There they are, the passage. This also points something out to us. It also points out to us that the book of Job must have taken place long before the time of Solomon, and that Solomon could not have possibly written the book unless he got the manuscript some, from some relative of Moses. For notice the constant references to an age just past. The modern fundamental commentators and conservatives that place the action of the book of Job up around the time of Solomon uh, are full of beans, to put it politely, or prunes, to put it with charity. For the constant references are to an age just past. Notice, please, Job 12:15. Job 11.16, Job 8.8, 8, Job 22.16, Job 4.18, Job 31.33. There is no discussion of any house of God anywhere in the book. There is no discussion of any written book anywhere in the book. And the subject was not wisdom of the book of Proverbs, but suffering. In the book of Job, Job, all references to words and laws and commandments are speaking of personal morality, not the Ten Commandments, and social ethics, not the body of legalistic doctrines that we find in the book of Exodus. Notice 31.28 and 42.8. That is, the entire tone and main teaching of the book of Job is pre-Mosaic. And the teaching is, the best works do not justify a man, and that is not the tone of the books written by Solomon. You'll find works constantly in the Proverbs, talking about works and righteousness, work and righteousness. The book of Job teaches that no matter how good a man's works are, if he's trusting his works to Satan, he's out of place. He's in the wrong pew. Now, I point these things out to reconfirm in the student's mind the fact that deals with the great antiquity of the book of Job. This is a fact, and it is proved by the what Westcott and Hort called the intrinsic evidence, that is, the text of the book. There are all kinds of ways of saying things. We come now down to Job chapter 21. In Job chapter 21, verse 24, there's supposed to be a contradiction in the King James Bible where it speaks about a man's breast being full of milk. But, of course, anybody who read the book of Job knew perfectly well the expression was figurative, as anyone could tell. There are many figurative expressions in the book of Job. For, ja uh, for example, chapter 29, verse 6. Anybody knows perfectly well that the book of Job, there are many figurative expressions, and this is one of them. The peculiar alteration of this verse in Job chapter 21 to verse, 20, uh, verse 24 to the reading of the modern Bibles is a testimony of the great ignorant stupidity of the modern revision committees. Any man who had any sense and could read and read the Bible would know perfectly well the expression in Job 21, verse uh, 24 is figurative, as are many expressions in the book of Job. Eliphaz answers. Then he asks one of those great questions we've talked about and mentioned in our list of questions from the book of Job. In 22, verse 2, Eliphaz says, Can a man be profitable unto God, as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Which is a good question. I mean, after all, the Lord wants us to be righteous, and the Lord wants us to be wise, but after all, it's only for our own good. When the Lord says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, he's not stating the capricious whim of an egotist. He's telling us something that will work for us. After all, if you keep the first commandment, the devil couldn't get permission to try you out or work you over if you kept the first one. It's for your protection. So Eliphaz goes on in his tirade, and Job answers in chapter 23. And when he answers in 23, he says a great truth in verse 12. He says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. 
In plain words, there's evidence that the Lord revealed himself at different times to saints in the Old Testament, even before the getting of the law, even before Moses. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Which shows that at a time that God did reveal himself and did speak to people before the book was written. Now this will raise a howl of protest from the a modern apostate fundamentalist who keeps talking about the verbally inspired originals yet has no use for what God preserved. But the horrible truth of the matter is, in Genesis 12, verse 1, the Lord said something to Abraham, and he did not say it in a written book. In Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country. That was a verbal speech given to Abraham, which he heard. Notice again in Genesis chapter 6 and 7, two whole chapters that God spoke to Noah before anybody wrote them down. Again, this clearly shows us that the action in the book of Job takes place before the giving of the law. Whatever took place in Job took place long before anybody committed to writing anything that God said. And of God's word which God had spoken, Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Didn't you read back in Numbers chapter 12 where the Lord said he'd make himself known by dreams and visions? You don't have to worry about the American Indian before Christopher Columbus. What you've got to worry about is the fellow going into Kmart and Shoppers Fair in 1978. A man said to me one time, well, what about the heathen? Never heard where they go. I said they go to Montgomery Ward and Sears. Job knew what God said. Most of the heathen and pagan people back before the time of Christ knew much more about what God said than the college professors at the University of Ohio do in the 20th century. I have seen the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. A great statement. A great profession of faith which we're to believe and take at face value. And yet what a remarkable confession of faith. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Like the faithful servant Eleazar who came to see Laban, when he sat down at the table, Job could say, Before you serve me the meal, let's talk about what my master said. Wouldn't it be something if you esteemed a feast from the word of God more than a feast spread in your table? One time David said, he rejoiced when he found the word of God like a man that found great spoil. I don't know very many Christians that rejoice when they find the word of God more than they rejoice if they found $150,000 to you. Certainly not this modern cultured crowd that goes bragging about the originals and bragging about what they should have said. Why, well, bless your soul, they don't have seen the words of his mouth more than the necessary food. They change the words of his mouth in order to earn a living to put food in the stomach. Don't you know that? And you people that esteem the words of his mouth more than your meals, do you know what they'd call you? They'd call you bibliolaters. Or sometimes they're called Ruckmanites. I've heard that one too. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Christ said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. And if some of you people, as God is my witness, if some of you people fed your dog, like you feed your soul, he'd starve to death in less than two weeks. Some of you people don't throw yourself a bone in the word of God more than once a week. Not so with Job. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And then he states the great lament that is true and comes down to the ages like the knell of a, of a like the toll and knell of a bell over a grave digger's house. He is of one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore am I troubled at his presence, when I consider I am afraid of him. For God maketh my heart soft, and the Almighty troubleth me. Very true. People talk about letting God have his will. God will have his will, one way or another. You may have your will now, he'll have his will in the end. And he says, I'm troubled at his presence when I consider I'm afraid of him. That was one of Job's redeeming features. The Bible said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When Job confesses he's afraid of the Lord and fears the Lord, he gives out a confession and a profession of faith before his uh, buddies they should have taken heed to. 
The Lord said in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, For all these things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. You want God to pay attention to you? Here it comes. Isaiah 66, 2. But to this man will I look. The Lord said, You want to have me have respect for you? I'll tell you what kind of man I've got respect for. But to this man I will look. To a man with five earned degrees? No. To a man who has mastered the originals? No. <clears throat> to a man who believes in the fundamentals of the faith? No. To a man who takes the sacraments and joins the church that Christ founded? No. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. And Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food, and when I consider, I am afraid of him. People say, well, perfect love casts out fear. That's true, but that's a New Testament concept. And that doesn't eradicate the difficulty at all, nor alleviate it. For example, the same New Testament that said, perfect love casteth out fear, said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Or as Job says in Job 23, 13, But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. Someday God will intervene in your life and do something you don't like. Some folk get bitter about it. Some people become atheists. Some people reject every last vestige of biblical Christianity because God did something they don't like. You know what their trouble is? They're in the spot Job's in. God is doing something to Job without a cause, something he can't explain, something he can't figure out, and the Lord is doing it, and Job can't stop him. There's nothing he can do about it, and Job's getting bitter about it. But by the same token, he fears God. He's afraid. He's not so scared that he won't express his bitterness, but he's so afraid that when he sinks down into quietness and reverie and thinks the thing over, he says to himself, I can't stop God. And if God wants to kill me, he'll kill me. On it goes. And in chapter 25, Bildad the Shuhite speaks up again for the second time. And then he asks another one of these great hallmark questions which mark out the book of Job as the greatest work in philosophy ever written, bar none. He says in 25.4, How then can man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? That's a good question. How then can man be justified with God? You're down here in an ant heap. After you're dead and gone, outside of your immediate family, nobody's going to miss you very much. Like one of the colored brethren said down south, he said, if you want to find out how much folks miss you, after you're gone, just go down in the pond and stick your finger in the pond and pull it out and watch them ripples. <clears throat> They'll be all through rippling in less than two minutes. How then can man be justified with God? You're an ant on an ant heap. He's the Lord of glory. You're confined to a little old box here of skin and bones, of flesh and clay, and curdle-like cheese and milk, a little old body that is so frail and so feeble that if an iron blade hits it, it hurts all over. God Almighty is back there beyond the Father's confines of the universe, creating new galaxies, back there where time ceases, where molecular action ceases, where absolute zero is reached with no passage of time. How then can a man be justified with God? Here's a man, he's born, <clears throat> he has it on his tombstone, so-and-so born, such-and-such such a date, so-and-so died, such-and-such such a date. How can such a man be justified with a God who lives forever and lifts up his hand to heaven and says, I am, I am that I am? How then can man be justified with God? Good question. Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Birth is an unclean thing when it's the most sanitary. How can a man be clean that is born of a woman? The implied answer is, of course, that he can't. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Is found in the book of Job. That question is asked. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Not one. That's why the Bible says, ye must be born again. There's something wrong with the first birth. And the reason why no philosopher can answer the question, how can he be clean that is born of a woman, is the dumb, stupid philosopher thinks that if you're born of a woman, you're all right. 
The question plainly implies that you're not all right. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. You must be born again. Then we have a scientific note in chapter 25, verse 5, which I'll come back and comment upon later when we get to the great scientific questions in Job chapter 38. Continuing on in Job chapter 26, Job answers. When he answers, he states six questions, which, if I don't miss my guess, are the six questions that will be asked at the judgment seat of Christ. Now examine the passage. It's remarkable in its universality. I don't suppose six more leading questions could be asked or more incriminating questions if a prosecuting attorney asked them in a trial. Notice that of these six questions, at least four of them had to do with speech. I read in the New Testament, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I read in the book of Proverbs, Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If words are such important things that a man is justified or condemned by his words, then certainly in any kind of a judgment the matter of speech is going to come up. Now look at these six remarkable questions which Job asks his tormentors. Verse 2, How hast thou helped him that is without power? That'll be the first question. How'd you help your fellow man, especially the one that had no power? How savest thou the arm that had no strength? How'd you help out the fellow who couldn't help himself? Now the words start. One, how hast thou counseled him that had no wisdom? What'd you tell him? How'd you counsel him? The fellow wasn't saved. He had no wisdom. The fear of the Lord at the beginning of wisdom. How did you counsel him? Did you tell him it was all right? Did you tell him there's no such thing as good and evil? Did you tell him about hell? Did you tell him how long it was? How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? When people came to you with questions about marriage and divorce and separation and remarriage and jobs and schools, how would you counsel them? And how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? Whew. There's a question for a preacher. There's a question for a Bible teacher. You hit the judgment, the Lord will say, how did you plentifully declare the thing as it is? Not as you saw it. Not that subjective nonsense that comes from the Harvard five-foot shelf of classics and the Westcott and Hort theory of a Lucian recension. Not that unadulterated baloney. How did you declare the thing as it was? Not as pictured by the Associated Press and Life and Time magazine. Not as taught by the faculty members of the leading schools. How have you plentifully declared the thing as it is? One more time he deals with words. Having asked two questions about words, he says in verse 4, To whom hast thou uttered words? Who'd you witness to? To whom hast thou uttered words? Paul said, uh, I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. And finally, whose spirit came from thee? Now, if you ever read six questions, they're important questions, for the Christian who faces the judgment seat of Christ, those are the questions. How did you help a man that had no power? How did you save the arm that had no strength? How did you counsel the man that had no wisdom? How did you plentifully declare the truth as it is? To whom did you speak? And when you spoke, whose spirit came from you? Now, when I talk through this microphone, one of three spirits is coming out of my mouth. I'm either ministering the Spirit of God to my congregation or my listener, in which case the Holy Spirit is coming out of my mouth, or else I'm ministering my own spirit, in which case the Spirit of man is coming out of my mouth, or I'm ministering an unclean spirit, in which case the Spirit of Satan is coming out of my mouth. Now the question is, whose spirit came to me? Job was putting his tormentors on the spot. They had not helped him when he had no power, they couldn't save the arm that had no strength. They hadn't counseled him correctly. They didn't say the thing as it was. And the spirit that came from them was obviously their own spirit, the devil's spirit, because certainly the Lord corrects them at the end of the book and tells them they haven't spoken the thing that is right. Then we get to chapter 27. We get to chapter 27. We read, Moreover, Job continued his parable. 
Now, there's a remarkable turn of events. You haven't been told that up till now, but now you're told that he's speaking a parable. And this is remarkable when one considers the content of Job chapter 26, 27, 28, 29. And notice in Job 29, 1, he still continues his parable. In chapter 30, he still continues his parable. As a matter of fact, 27, 28, 29, and 30 plainly apply to other things beside the immediate condition of Job and the situation which he finds himself. For it is plainly said to be a parable. Now, one of the remarkable things we notice about the Bible is when we get to John chapter 10, verse 1 to 4, that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks there about the door and the good shepherd and going into the door and coming out of the door. And you'd think that was perfectly apparent in a spiritual application. But when we get to John chapter 10, verse 6, we read, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Now, in John chapter 10, verse 1 to 5, is a simple little story about a door and a thief trying to get up inside and getting kicked out, and a shepherd going through the door, and the shepherd coming out of the door and calling his sheep, and the sheep going into the door after him, and then coming out the next day following him. But it is said to be a parable, John 10, 6. Now, here we find one of the most remarkable things we've seen, because here in Job chapter 27, when we read, Moreover, Job continued his parable. Look what the immediate context was. 26.14 Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Somebody said, what does the thunder of his power have to do with the parable? Very simple. In John chapter 10, verse 1 to 5, the parable had to do with the rapture and the advent, and Christ calling his sheep out of the world into the fold and then leading them back out at the advent. And when Job speaks about the thunder of his power, lo and behold, we find the references to the rapture. Look at Job 37, verse 1 to 4. Job 37, verse 1 to 4. At this also my heart trembles and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice, the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven, and is lightning to the end of the earth. After it a voice roareth. He thunders, there it goes, with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them, whoever that is, when his voice is heard. When the call comes, come up hither, and the good shepherd call the sheep out by name, it will sound like thunder. And that's the thunder of Job 26, 14, and Job 37. And when the God the Father spoke to Jesus Christ in John chapter 12, the people that stood by said, It thundered. Job 27. So we see the book of Job goes far beyond the immediate context uh, the Edomite sufferer sitting on the pile of ashes down there in Edomia, tormented by his three friends. Job continues his parable, Job 27, verse 1. Quite naturally, the material is hidden from every major commentary in the last 300 years, as every major commentator in the last 300 years tried to correct the King James Bible with a finding of scholarship and consequently covered up the truth. SOP, as they say in the Army, Standard Operating Procedure, or par for the course. And then Job starts, and Job says in verse 5, God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. Ah, Job, you shouldn't have said that. That was the trouble with Job. 27.6, my righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. And he had to renege on that one. He let it go. Thank God he let it go. When the Lord finally appeared to old Job, you know what Job said in Job chapter 42, verse 6, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He had to let go of his righteousness. And I'm here to tell you, friend, listening to this series of studies, you'll never get to heaven as long as you hold fast to your own righteousness. 
The trouble with Job was not that he was wrong. The trouble was he was right, and he knew it. And he was trusting his righteousness. And the Bible says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Jesus Christ has made unto us righteousness, sanctification, wisdom, and redemption. That's the great theme of the book of Romans, the righteousness of God, that he might be just and justify of him that believeth on Jesus Christ. Now, these things are clear. I don't care what you've read or what you've been taught or how you've been trained or what information you've had access to. Your righteousness in the Bible is delineated as filthy rags. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. And as long as you hold fast your own righteousness, you'll never see God's face with favor. Job says, Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. He'll have to. My righteous I hold fast. You're going to have to let it go. And will not let it go. You'll have to, Job. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. Well, you can take your hat off to Job. He was a man of integrity. And God gave him credit for that. You'll have to take your hat off to Job. He was sincere and honest and knew himself to that own self be true and all that jazz. And God gave him credit for it. But of him it might be said what was said of Naaman the Syrian, he was a great man and honorable with his master, but he was a leper. And Job was righteous, faithful, honest, sincere, upright, and a man of integrity. But he was a self-righteous sinner. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And if you ever want to face the omnipotent, almighty, eternal, everlasting creator with favor, I'll give you some good advice, and it'll be the best advice you'll have this year or any year. Let go of your own righteousness. Quit trusting it. Quit trusting your good deeds and your church membership and your baptism and your sacraments and your golden rule, your little kitty car religion with your little Ten Commandments. And rest your soul in the naked word of God and put your faith in the righteousness of God's Son, God's righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved.